From NPR, this is Living on Earth. I'm Bruce Gellerman. Popcorn is America's favorite snack, but for people who prepare it for a living, it can be life-threatening. Some say workplace safety hasn't caught up with the science of popcorn ingredients. As the scientific information developed, not a single regulatory agency stepped forward to even look at the extent of the problem. OSHA, which is in charge of protecting workers in the American workplace, did absolutely nothing. And what about microwaving popcorn at home? Also, the EPA turns a deaf ear to its own science advisors who wanted to limit the levels of soot in the air. Many advisors are unhappy, and neither are public health advocates. Unfortunately, I'm afraid what we're going to see is a big victory for big polluters, and breathers are going to suffer a big defeat. And we have the scoop on cheap poo paper. (laughs) That and more this week on Living on Earth. Stick around. Support for Living on Earth comes from the National Science Foundation and Stonyfield Farm. From the Jennifer and Ted Stanley Studios in Somerville, Massachusetts, this is Living on Earth. I'm Bruce Gellerman, sitting in for Steve Kerwood. We begin our show with a story about allegations that federal regulators have failed to protect workers who make one of our favorite snack foods. Popcorn. Popcorn is fun. Fun to make, fun to eat. We love this stuff. Americans eat more than a billion pounds of popcorn a year. According to the industry, that's nearly 14 gallons of popcorn for every man, woman, and child in the country. But for some people, workers in factories where butter-flavored popcorn is produced, it's not fun. It can be fatal. I do know of one girl that died from it. She was really in bad shape when she did. In the 1990s, Ed Pennell and Linda Redman worked at a microwave popcorn packing factory in Jasper, Missouri. Linda Redman died last May, one of three victims who died from what's called popcorn lung disease, or bronchiolitis obliterans. The disease scars small airways in the lung, so victims have to struggle to breathe. It's irreversible. There's no treatment. Ed Pennell was also diagnosed with popcorn lung in 2000. When I started getting sick, it was uh, like having the flu almost, you know. I had a a nagging, hacking cough, and I just got worse and worse. In fact, I went into the hospital. They thought I had pneumonia. When I come out, I didn't get any better. They didn't have any idea what it was. Bronchiolitis obliterans is a rare disease, but when health inspectors from NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, investigated the Jasper, Missouri popcorn plant six years ago, they discovered five to 11 times the expected cases of lung disease. They also found workers at popcorn factories in three other Midwestern states suffering from popcorn lung. Federal investigators traced the outbreak to a chemical called dicetyl. Dicetyl is found in many things we eat and drink, beer, wine, vinegar, but industrial flavor manufacturers synthesize the chemical in much greater quantities, and it can become airborne in popcorn factories when it's mixed with hot oil or sprayed on kernels of corn to give them that buttery flavor. In 2001, after discovering the disease in popcorn workers, federal researchers exposed lab rats to vapors of dicetyl, similar to levels found in factories. Half the animals died in just six hours. The researcher called it the most dramatic case of cell death she'd ever seen. In Missouri, at least one plant substantially lowered worker exposure to flavor chemicals, yet these controls were never made mandatory by federal regulators. Dr. David Michaels, a professor of public health at George Washington University, calls it a regulatory failure. As the scientific information developed, not a single regulatory agency stepped forward to even look at the extent of the problem. OSHA, which is in charge of protecting workers in the American workplace, did absolutely nothing. This summer, after at least two California popcorn workers fell gravely ill, Dr. Michaels circulated a petition. It was signed by 42 prominent scientists and public health researchers. It urged federal regulators and California officials to set emergency limits for dicetyl. Right now, there is no exposure limit for the chemical. And because it never set a limit, OSHA argues there's nothing to enforce. Now, that's not unusual. There are more than a 1,000 artificial ingredients suspected of causing inhalation injuries to workers, but the federal government has set permissible exposure limits for less than 50 flavors. Since the law makes it difficult to sue your employer, 
popcorn production workers who became ill went after the makers of the artificial butter flavor. They won 53 cases. There are a hundred more pending. John Halligan is general counsel of the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association, whose members were sued. But Halligan says even before the settlements, the association was holding safety workshops and sending out bulletins to flavor makers showing them how to limit workplace exposure to dicetyl. Obviously, the safety of our workers is very, very important. We haven't waited for regulation. You know, when we found out about the potential dangers of butter flavor from NIOSH back in September 2001, we jumped right into it and began providing assistance to our workers. Um, At this point, we would welcome regulation, science-based regulation, but we haven't waited for that. OSHA would be responsible for coming up with those regulations, but despite repeated requests, no one from the agency was available for an interview in time for this broadcast. Now, the Food and Drug Administration considers dicetyl safe to eat, but the FDA hasn't studied what happens when the chemical is vaporized in a microwave oven. Request to the Food and Drug Administration for an interview referred Living on Earth back to OSHA. Again, David Michaels of George Washington University. You would think that the FDA would step up to the plate and say, well, we're going to look at this problem because we know that high levels of exposure are killing people. So what are the effects of low levels of exposure? People who pop popcorn at home. And we just don't know the answer to that. So are there harmful effects from microwaving buttered popcorn at home? Well, it turns out the EPA, the only federal agency that would talk to us about dicetyl, has studied that very question. EPA scientists did an experiment. They popped 50 bags of microwave popcorn and analyzed the vapors. The results aren't final and haven't been released, but Dr. William Farlin, the EPA's deputy administrator for science, says consumers have nothing to fear. As we do these kinds of studies, if something should pop up that suggests that there is an acute risk, We would always make sure that the public was aware of that, that we contacted our colleagues in Food and Drug Administration or the Consumer Product Safety Commission and so on. As for workers at movie theaters who pop popcorn, no one knows if their workplace exposures are dangerous. There is no research. But investigators have found health effects in popcorn factories at levels hundreds of times lower than they expected. Meanwhile, Ed Pennell, the popcorn worker in Jasper, Missouri, who's been on disability for six years, waits for the lung transplant he needs but doesn't want. Because when you get a lung transplant, you've pretty much decided how long you're going to live. I think it's five or seven years after you get a transplant, you die. California officials will hold a meeting to consider the petition for an emergency standard for Dicetyl at the end of September. So far, there's no word from OSHA on when it might consider the request. It's being called one of the most important public health decisions in years, and many health advocates are not happy with it. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has defied the recommendation of its own science advisors on regulating the tiny airborne particles in soot. Living on Earth's Washington correspondent Jeff Young joins us to discuss the fallout. And Jeff, in this case, I guess uh, the use of the word fallout is more than just an expression, huh? Uh, Yeah, we're talking actual fallout here from power plants, smokestacks, uh, tailpipes of autos, uh, all of these mixing together to form these little particles and droplets that we then breathe in. And scientists have known for a long time that particulate matter is a health hazard. It's linked to asthma attacks, hospital visits, respiratory disease, and premature death. And uh, many, many recent studies have reinforced that. But the health standards had not been updated in nine years. So EPA was under a court order to review those standards. Hmm. And and what did uh, the EPA do? Well, EPA tightened one standard, the daily standard on particulate matter, by about 50 percent. And EPA Administrator Stephen Johnson says the result will be fewer premature deaths and lowered health costs. I am proud to announce my final decision. EPA is issuing the most health-protective national air quality standards in our nation's history. That sounds pretty good to me, Jeff. Why are public health groups uh, so upset about that? 
Well, while EPA tightened one standard, it left another very important one unchanged, and that's the annual average standard, which is a very important measure of the sort of day-in, day-out exposure that people have. And most scientists said that should be made stronger in order to protect public health as the law requires. And nearly every public health and medical group that you can think of, the American Medical Association, the pediatricians, the Thoracic Society, they all said this standard should be stricter. And EPA did not follow that advice. A Harvard Medical School professor, Dr. Frank Spizer, is a member of the EPA's Board of Science Advisors. It's called the Clean Air Science Advisory Committee. It also recommended a stronger standard. Spizer says the bottom line on this is that the difference between what EPA chose and what his committee recommended means more people will continue to die prematurely. If they go with the number that they have at the present time, you can be assured that at least as many people who died in 9-11 will die each year from air pollution in this country. It probably means that the political influences they're listening to has more weight than the scientific influence. Now, Jeff, what does Spicer mean uh, when he talks about political influence? Well, this is the first time that an EPA administrator has not followed the recommendations of the agency's science advisory committee when setting one of these final health standards. And that committee's been around for more than 30 years, so naturally that's going to raise some suspicion. Well, how does the EPA explain that, not following the advice of its own advisors? EPA Administrator Johnson says it's because there was no unanimous agreement among the committee members. And he says uh, this is a complex issue, and because there was no unanimity there, it shows that reasonable people can disagree. However, you look a little more closely at what the committee actually told Administrator Johnson, and you find that only two of 22 members disagreed here. All the others said the best science points to a need for a stronger standard. Dr. Rogene Henderson is with the Loveless Respiratory Center in Albuquerque, and she chairs the Science Advisory Committee. To choose to go with the minority opinion when it is a small minority is unusual. So I think they chose a path which may have been convenient, but it is not based on the best science available. So if they weren't listening to their own science advisors, uh, who were they listening to? Well, some public health and environmental groups say the real reason EPA did not follow its own advisors is because of the Bush administration's connections to the power industry. Frank O'Donnell is with a group called Clean Air Watch. And a lot of what we're seeing, I believe, is a reaction to the lobbying by the electric power industry, which has pretty much said, well, we're going to clean up a little bit of stuff in the future, but we're not going to go as far as those uh, health nuts want us to go. Unfortunately, I'm afraid what we're going to see is a big victory for big polluters and breathers are going to suffer a big defeat. So public health groups are really upset. Um, What, if anything, can they do about it? What's next for them? Well, this health standard is is very important in guiding other decisions down the road on how to clean up soot in the air. So I think we can expect a legal challenge here. And public health groups have made it clear they're already poring over this decision, looking for any vulnerable points of attack. And also, because this is a dispute about science and not following the uh, EPA uh, science advisors, I'm sure this is going to be more ammunition for the administration's critics who say this administration and this president ignore science when making policy decisions. Jeff Young is Living on Earth's Washington correspondent. Thanks, Jeff. You're welcome, Bruce. Coming up, happy meals with toy hummers make green bloggers unhappy. Keep listening to Living on Earth. It's Living on Earth. I'm Bruce Gellerman. Al Gore insists he's not running for president again, but he's been campaigning for the environment lately, and he's had sharp words for the Bush administration. In a speech he gave at NYU Law School, Gore warned that we're running out of time to save the planet from global warming. Well, first of all, I think we should start by immediately freezing CO2 emissions and then beginning sharp reductions. Merely engaging in high-minded debates about theoretical future reductions while continuing to steadily increase emissions represents a self-delusional and reckless approach. In some ways, that approach is worse than doing nothing at all because it lulls the gullible into thinking that something is actually being done when, in fact, it is not. Gore's former boss was also campaigning for the environment this past week. Bill Clinton hosted the second Clinton Global Initiative. 
The annual conference is a gathering of some of the world's most powerful thinkers and politicians brought together to solve the world's toughest problems and raise money to do the job. Carol Browner is a member of the initiative's Energy and Climate Change Advisory Board. She was the head of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Clinton administration. We called her at her office in Washington. Ms. Browner, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. Well, you heard the criticism by Al Gore. He said, you know, it's enough of talking. We've got to do something. Well, precisely, and I think when it comes to, to, to climate change, you know, we've been talking uh, for over 20 years now, and it's time to get on with doing things. And part of the a number of the commitments at this conference speak directly to the issue of climate change, whether it's uh, looking at how to get boards of directors of multinationals to accept responsibility, renewable energy, looking at both electricity and fuels, very, very far-reaching ideas. This is a who's who of the world scientists, Nobel Prize winners, uh, presidents, prime ministers, queens, kings. Uh, Do you think they'll sign on to what, well, Gore is calling for an immediate freeze on CO2? Well, I think some will sign on to that. I think uh, equally important, uh, some will make commitments within their companies to switch fuel, to look for alternatives, to invest uh, money into getting about the business of actually reducing their greenhouse gases, of reducing the footprint, the impact they're having on the world's environment and the health of of our environment and the health of the world's citizens. I I know this is a a bipartisan meeting, the uh, Clinton Global Initiative, but is there any way you can avoid politics? Well, I think this is in some ways outside of politics. It is absolutely bipartisan, but as important as that is, it's finding ways to work together that perhaps haven't been explored before or wouldn't be explored but for putting people in the same room. Will we be able to really measure uh, the effect of this conference? I mean, next year at this time, if I were to talk to you and you'd say, well, we were successful and here's how. Well, I think you take the commitment, and if a commitment is made to reduce someone's carbon impact by 20%, you can go out and measure that. If a commitment was made to work with 20, 30 boards of directors, go out and find out what happened. Did you educate those people? That's the first step. But more importantly, did those boards of directors of multinationals make a decision to change how their company was doing business? Well, what do you feel the Bush administration should be doing to address climate change? Well, obviously, um, this has been a passion of mine for many years, and I'm disappointed this administration has not taken the lead. I think the single most important thing we can do now is call on Congress to set a cap, a national cap on greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, let's get, you know, working within the economy to find sort of the common sense, the cost-effective ways to go about reducing our carbon impact. One of the reasons that the Bush administration has been against reducing um, carbon dioxide emissions is because he says that we can't afford it. Well, you know, we've heard that argument time and time again when it comes to protecting our environment, our air, our water, that somehow or another we have to choose between a healthy environment and, and, you know, a healthy economy. We don't have to make that choice. We we, we proved that during the eight years of the Clinton-Gore administration. Certainly there will be changes. I'm not saying that this would be without impacts, but the idea that it's all negative is simply not the case. At this conference, we have lots of people who are making investments. They believe there's going to be a return on those investments, investments that will reduce reduce greenhouse gases that will reduce carbon emissions. Well, Ms. Browner, thank you very much. Thank you. Carol Browner is on the Energy and Climate Change Advisory Board of the Clinton Global Initiative. She was head of the EPA during the Clinton administration. So what would happen to the economy if we took Al Gore's advice and hit the brakes on carbon dioxide emissions? person who's thought a lot about that question is Robert Stavins. Professor Stavins is the director of the Environmental Economics Program at Harvard University. I think that that, uh, the vice president has a point in which he says that global climate change is a very important problem. The question is, is to do something about it that's going to work, that's going to be sensible. And the most important thing to recognize about this environmental problem that really distinguishes it from the other environmental problems we've dealt with, and I've studied these and worked on them both at Harvard and in Washington and uh, for 25 years, is that this is a stock, not a flow problem. What we're concerned about is the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, not the flow at any moment in time. And therefore, it's very important to recognize is that we have flexibility in terms 
terms of the timing with which we can deal with the problem. And therefore, there's no reason, even if it were a crisis, which I don't think it is at present, there's no reason to think in terms of freezing emissions. Rather, what we need to do is to get onto a sensible trajectory to bring about the kinds of long-term technological change that's required to shift us gradually from coal to petroleum to natural gas and indeed away from fossil fuels altogether. That's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight with coal-fired power plants or your car or my car or your furnace or mine. But we need to begin to send the signals to begin to do that. Critics of the Bush approach say what's needed are mandatory caps on emissions. Does that make sense from an economic point of view? I agree that uh, a cap on emissions will be required. I don't think there's any doubt about the fact that voluntary approaches, which are what a, are a big part of the Bush administration's approach, that voluntary approaches will not be sufficient. And the reason, of course, they won't be sufficient is there are real costs of addressing the problem. If there were no costs by the way, then voluntary approaches will be fine. Everyone will be jumping up and down and just doing them. But there are real costs, and that's why voluntary approaches are not sufficient. A cap will be required. The question is, what's the right trajectory over time for that cap? And what I would say, based upon all the economic analysis that's been done, and that's in Europe, the United States, in Japan, Australia, around the world, it points to the notion of slowing the emissions, the rate of growth of emissions of greenhouse gases, principally carbon dioxide, stopping that growth, and then reversing that growth, and then taking it down much more severe than even the Kyoto Protocol would have that that's the time path that's actually needed. Professor, are economics and environmentalism um, at odds, or can you have both? Can it help the economy, or does it harm the economy by going green? Oh, I, look, the, the causes of environmental problems are fundamentally economic. It's as a result of market activity that we have environmental problems in the first place. Furthermore, there are important economic consequences of environmental problems. Hence, an economic perspective is essentially very, very, very helpful. Indeed, it's, a, it's essential to really diagnosing the problems and doing something about them that's sensible. Um, what one can do is to address environmental problems and address them in the most cost-effective way. There are sacrifices. We spend right now a substantial amount on environmental protection in the United States, and we're not in a constant recession. That doesn't mean there's zero cost because they don't throw us into recession. So, of course, we can grow the economy and also address environmental problems. Professor, thank you very much. My pleasure. Robert Stevens is director of the Environmental Economics Program at Harvard University. Well, the state of California is not content with just having the toughest limits on greenhouse gas emissions in the country. Now it's playing hardball. The state is suing the six largest automakers in the world. We believe we can establish that the harms are occurring in California from global warming and that they're occurring now. That's California Deputy Attorney General Ken Alex. His office charges the state spends millions of dollars as a result of damage from global warming and increased health care costs, wildfires, beach erosion and pollution. He says a lot of it's due to the greenhouse gas emissions spewed by cars. Vehicles emit 30 percent of the carbon dioxide in California, and the state's lawsuit says the automakers should be the ones footing the bill. But Deputy AG Ken Alex says the real goal of the lawsuit is to get the car companies to build cleaner cars. To be honest, we hope that the next iteration of the automobile is a global warming fighter and that the automobile industry is part of the solution to the problem. I think that would be the best possible outcome here. The Alliance of Automobile Manufacturers have called California's lawsuit a nuisance. This summer, McDonald's teamed up with General Motors for a Happy Meals promotion. They gave away plastic toy Hummers, and environmentalists are not loving it. Does Mickey D's deserve a break today, or are the giveaway Hummers teaching kids to glorify the hulking gas guzzlers? 
The issue sent legions of green bloggers into hyper-cyberspace. Leading the way was Nick Astor from San Francisco, founder of the popular blog TriplePundit.com, which looks at environmental, social, and business issues. Hello, Nick. Hey, how you doing? I'm fine, thanks. So, you know, it's called a Happy Meal, but it doesn't seem to be making you very happy. What's your problem? (laughs) It is a Happy Meal. I think that the issue with the Hummer is that a Hummer isn't really a happy image, at least uh, not to a lot of people. What about to you? Not really to me. I think a Hummer to me is sort of this classic, almost to the point of cliche, example of excess and greed and disregard for the environment and the people around us. But you know, Nick, sometimes a toy is just a toy. It's true, it is. But the thing about the Hummer is is it has enough symbolism attached to it that I think that even with kids, it goes a little bit beyond just a toy. Well, you helped launch a blog storm. I mean, talk about a firestorm of protests. A lot of other blogs picked you up. And and I'm wondering about using a blog to conduct this type of corporate protest. Well, you know, interestingly, I think that a blog storm, if you want to call it that, uh, turns out to be a pretty effective form of getting one's point across when it comes to issues like this. My whole beef with the whole thing is that McDonald's has made a very public statement that they care about the environment. And I think that giving away toy hummers in Happy Meals flies in the face of that claim. Well, one person wrote on your blog that if all McDonald's toys were promotional, then their last one, Pirates of the Caribbean, would have been promoting a a, a pirate lifestyle of raping, (laughs) pillaging, and plundering. You know, (laughs) where do you draw the line between harmless toys and manipulative promotion? (laughs) Well, I think that the Pirates of the Caribbean promo would have been promoting uh, going to see the film, which it probably did effectively. You know, I personally am not taking so much the stance of let's hammer McDonald's and make them look bad. They've done quite a bit with regards to packaging. Uh, We all know about the progress that McDonald's has made with regards to rainforest beef and some of their other sourcing issues. I'm sort of taking the perspective of let's think about what McDonald's could have done better. The vice president for McDonald's said you you should write on their blog, actually. Um, I did, as a matter of fact. I left a uh, comment, and I suggested to them that they might be better off talking to Honda or even the Tesla people and giving away a car that uh, represents new technologies like hybrid uh, motors or, or electric cars or even some sort of gadget that demonstrates the effectiveness and the coolness, if you will, of uh, wind power that I think kids would get a kick out of. A, a little plastic windmill? Sure, why not? It's a zany idea, but imagine if McDonald's got big into renewable energy and gave away little toys, windmills that you could blow on it, lights up a light, something like that. I'm sure there's plenty of toy companies that would be uh, interested in promoting something like that. And I'm sure kids would go crazy for it, and they'd probably play with them a lot more than they'd play with a Hummer, which winds up in the bottom of the sandbox after a few days. Or how about a hybrid Hummer? (laughs) It's a step. It's a step, I guess. Of course, the irony is that the thing's so big that you're probably uh, defeating the point. You might as well drive a regular gas car, and you'd, you'd still be better off. Schwarzenegger drives a biodiesel Hummer, which is definitely a, uh, a step in the right direction. So that, that would be progress. Nick Astor runs TriplePundit.com. Thanks, Nick. Thanks very much. Well, to be fair, we put a call to McDonald's headquarters in Oak Brook, Illinois. It's home to Hamburger U, where they came up with the Hummer of a Summer Happy Meal promotion. Bill Whitman is a spokesperson for McDonald's. Mr. Whitman, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Thanks for having me, Bruce. Why a Hummer? Well, why not a Hummer? I certainly appreciate the fact that there are some who have concerns about the environment, which we certainly share. We have a long history of responsibility for the environment, and uh, uh, we will continue to do so. But the Happy Meal promotion with a, a Hummer toy certainly speaks to what children do best, and that is use their imagination and play. Do you ever consider uh, maybe a hybrid car? Well, we haven't gotten to that point yet. It uh, doesn't mean that we won't and doesn't mean that we wouldn't consider it when the opportunity presents itself. You know, Mr. Whitman, I once read that McDonald's was the biggest distributor of toys in the world. 
Yeah, we're also the nation's largest distributor of fresh sliced apples. So McDonald's with 13,000 restaurants in the U.S. with 26 million customers coming through our restaurants every day. We do a lot of things in big numbers, but we're most proud of the commitment that we have to our customers and the communities that we serve to ensure that we're doing the right things for the right reasons. And uh, that's a commitment that McDonald's has uh, shared uh, for many years, and we will continue to demonstrate and act in a socially responsible way. Well, Mr. Whitman, I want to thank you very much. Bruce, thanks for having me. Bill Whitman is a spokesperson for McDonald's USA. Time now to hear from you, our listeners. Our recent story about the benefits of planting vegetation sky-high on green roofs prompted several listeners to write in. Kenneth Meislick listens to Living on Earth on WNYC in New York. He likes the show and says the federal government should subsidize the greening of our cities. But Mary Crane Durr of Chicago was surprised we didn't talk about green roofs as places to grow local food. It seems the Windy City City Hall is a prime example, according to Ms. Crainder. The green roof on the building attracts birds and has beehives that produce up to 150 pounds of honey each year. Sweet! Our interview with Natural Resources Defense Council scientist Gina Solomon rubbed U.S. EPA press officer Dale Camry the wrong way. We asked Dr. Solomon to compare EPA's actions at Ground Zero to the way the agency handled contamination after Hurricane Katrina. Following our interview, we aired a soundbite for Mr. Camry on behalf of the EPA, but still he felt we had given him short shrift. So we asked him to comment again. Likening 9-11 to the disaster that befell New Orleans is like comparing the ocean and the sky. The Environmental Protection Agency learned from the events of 9-11 how to cope with major disasters. EPA tested for hundreds of toxins like lead, asbestos, and mold, and the results were analyzed both by the agency and an independent laboratory. EPA's Inspector General's office reported that EPA had done its job and reported its findings in a timely manner. Let us hear from you once, even twice, if you like. Give us a call on our listener line. The number is 800-218-9988. That's 800-218-9988. Or write us at 20 Holland Street, Somerville, Massachusetts, 02144. Our email address is comments at LOE.org. That's comments at LOE.org. And stop by our webpage at livingonearth.org, where you can hear us anytime. That's livingonearth.org. Keep listening to Living on Earth. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations and the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation. Online at MOTT.org, supporting efforts to promote a just, equitable, and sustainable society. The Kresge Foundation, investing in nonprofits to help them catalyze growth, connect to stakeholders, and challenge greater support. On the web at Kresge.org. And the Kellogg Foundation, helping people help themselves by investing in children, their families, and their communities. On the web at WKKF.org. This is NPR National Public Radio. It's Living on Earth. I'm Bruce Gellerman. Have you ever wondered how that new pair of jeans got that already lived-in look? They may have gotten that way at a factory in Mexico where the jeans are hand-rubbed with sandpaper, sprayed with color and bleaches, or even washed with rocks. It seems there's a price for fashion. A lot of water and chemicals are used in the process. Jana Schroeder traveled to a place that was once the blue jeans capital of the world and has our story. In a valley in central Mexico is the city of Tehuacan. The name means place of the gods in Nahuatl. The city used to be known for its pure spring water believed to have healing properties. Whenever you hear the word Tehuacan, you think on water because it has become famous all over the centuries because of the quality, the high quality of the mineral water that springs up in this area. Raul Hernandez has been working on water conservation in the Tehuacan area for 25 years. He says the local water has been ideal for bottling, and a popular brand of mineral water is even named after the city. Uh, Whenever you go into any restaurant in Mexico and you want mineral water, you don't ask for mineral water. You just say, I want a Tehuacan. The water was also once used in a thriving soft drink industry that has since fizzled out. 
Now, some of the abandoned facilities, built right over natural springs, are used by another industry that needs easy access to large volumes of water, the blue jean industry. One of the important processes in the blue jeans manufacturing is the stone washing to give this kind of worn look by adding chemicals for color and then stones for washing it away. Mr. Hernandez, who directs a nonprofit called Water Forever, says much of the water that goes into blue jean factories comes out contaminated with bleaches, detergents, dyes, and other chemicals. Bueno, the chief engineer for the group, Gerardo Reyes, drives us to a blue jeans laundry on the outskirts of the city. Sí, aquí lo puedes ver, ¿no? okay. Esta es la... We stop along the road just short of what looks like a small warehouse. Next to the road runs a stream of bright blue water in a narrow canal. It's coming from the plant. The engineer says the noise we hear comes from the laundry machines. He points to the blue water with bits of pumice stone and lint and says the water has obviously not been treated. He says this is worrisome since the aquifers, the underground water, are very close to the surface in this valley and easily contaminated. Farther downstream, the canal becomes overgrown with weeds, so we can't follow it to see where it goes. But a half mile from here is an old irrigation canal, the Valsequillo. This bigger canal was originally built to bring clean water from the hills above, but now it's used to collect wastewater. Local environmental authorities are trying to crack down. Here we have the last inspection we have done in a laundry. Martina Tella heads Tehuacan's environment office, which has banned any new blue jean laundries within city limits. Since he took this post last year, he's been inspecting those already operating. Sometimes that they do not want to open the door. It's one of the problems. We have to be in the right place at the right moment. What we need is to have a permanent inspection to see what is really happening there. At one facility, Mr. Atella found a treatment plant installed, but sitting idle. Critics of the industry say that's not an isolated case. But Mr. Atella points to what he thinks is a bigger problem. New blue jean factories, known as maquilas, are still coming in. But since the city tightened its standards, they're locating in outlying areas where there are no environment officials. Now, every year, more laundries are established because there are no regulations, local regulations. Mr. Atella says a regional approach is needed. Since his efforts are undone when contaminated water from the maquilas upstream flows down the Valsequillo Canal right through the city. But he says things are changing thanks to foreign environmental standards. There are enterprises, especially foreign companies, that are asking us to make the inspections because they need our official papers to testify that they are working well in order to export. And for us, that's wonderful. Many smaller maquilas that sell within Mexico are immune from this foreign pressure. So Mr. Atella says foreign companies are the best partners he's found for reaching environmental goals. Arturo Neira is the export manager at the largest blue jean maquila in the area, Cualquier Lavado. It churns out about 10 million pairs of jeans a year for leading U.S. brands such as Levi's, Gap, and Old Navy. Most of the prestigious brands uh, that we work with request that uh, we comply with all the environmental measures or laws. Obviously, it has a cost. I know we made a huge investment, more or less about $2 million. You know? Mr. Neira says the maquila sector is facing heavy criticism for worker treatment and environment standards, just when it's struggling to survive the tough competition. And right now, these industries, instead of growing, we're going down, you know, because we're competing against the, uh, the Orient, China, Central America, and they have labor costs which are a lot cheaper than ours. Mr. Neira takes me on a tour through the plant. He says the processes used are dictated by changing fashions. 
Sandblasting has been replaced by hand sanding blue jeans with sandpaper. We walk by an area where workers, covered from head to foot with protective suits, masks, and gloves, are spraying jeans with a bright purple chemical, potassium permanganate. Mr. Neira says the chemical, which should not be inhaled, is one of those used to give jeans that already worn look. His company has installed an expensive water treatment plant with a full-time engineer, but most plants are smaller and don't invest in these controls. Out behind the plant, Mr. Neira points to a small stream of clear water he says is the treated water from his factory. We watch it flow down into the Valsequillo Canal, where it immediately mixes with untreated wastewater from other maquilas, agricultural wastes, and sewage. Where does all this wastewater end up? The same place it did back when clear water ran through the canal, into cornfields downstream. Martin Barrios, the director of a human rights commission in Tehuacan, accompanies me about 12 miles down the valley to the farming community of San Diego Chalma. Mr. Barrios is a labor activist and has co-authored a book about blue jean maquilas. From the highway, we walk a short distance into a cornfield fed by an irrigation ditch filled with dirty water. Look at this cornfield. You can see it was irrigated yesterday or the day before. He picks up some of the soil. It has a bluish-gray layer on top that crumbles in his hand. This is where the blue water from the laundries reaches its final destination. Look at this handful of soil. It's all blue. Unfortunately, the negative side of globalization has brought this pollution from blue jeans to the fields. And now it contaminates the food we eat in Tehuacan. Local authorities concede that watering food crops with untreated industrial wastewater is a problem. Still, they say they haven't tested the liquid to find out exactly what's in it. Mexico has environmental standards that limit the contaminants allowed in industrial discharge. Yet 10 years after the standards went into effect, authorities in Tehuacan say inspections are still only in the planning stage. A treatment plant at the end of the canal is also still on the drawing board. They've been saying a treatment plan is coming for the last six years. Every year they say, next year. We need to demand that the treatment plant be built and paid for not just by the town. These foreign plants have to pay for the problem they're creating. It's everyone's responsibility. New blue jeans used to come off the shelf stiff and in a dark navy color. They took months to wear in. Some of today's young consumers may not remember that. Activists like Martin Barrios wish more people would ask what it takes to give jeans that already worn look and feel the first time you slip them on. For Living on Earth, I'm Jana Schroeder in Tehuacan, Mexico. Some people poo-poo recycling, but not Lawrence Toms. He recycles poo-poo. Lawrence Toms is a co-founder of Creative Paper Whales, maker of Sheep Poo Paper. To get the poop about the paper, sorry I couldn't resist, we phoned him and he joins us from Snowdonia, Wales. Mr. Toms, it's good to speak with you. Hello, Bruce. It's a lovely sunny day here in Snowdonia. Nice to speak to you. Sheep Poo Paper? Dare I ask where you got this uh, idea from? By all means, it, it's not entirely original, I have to tell you. I mean, the, the degree of originality is in using sheep. Um, in, in the developing world, it, it's well known to make um, paper out of elephant dung, for example. And indeed, dung is a, is a valuable commodity in, in developing countries where it's used as a, as a natural resource for a number of things, including fuel for fires. Um, and, and we just went out to, to view a couple of these operations in the Far East 
and uh, came back armed with information and tried to see whether we could make it work with sheep poo. And six months later, we worked out a way of doing it. Tell me how it's made. We find very fibrous um, sheep dung. We do sterilize the the sheep poo in a large um, industrial autoclave almost as soon as it arrives at, at, at our unit. And so once it's been through that, anything that survives that process would survive re-entry on the nose cone of the shuttle. So it, it's, it's sterile enough, uh, if you had a strong enough stomach, to, to eat at that stage. And then we run it through, a, through an antique piece of machinery called a Hollander beta, which reduces the fibers to pulp. They're then formed into sheets, and uh, we turn them into, into lovely products. Well, what, what about the, um, the water that comes out of the process? I would imagine there's waste from that. Uh, well, we don't really like the word waste, I have to tell you. Something is only wasted if it doesn't have a use and, and it causes a problem. Um, with, with our process, I think what's absolutely wonderful about it is that after we've washed the, the, the sheep poo, the water that is loaded with all of the nutrients, we sell to local growers as organic fertilizer. And it's been instrumental in winning a prize, prize vegetable competition. So it's in, it's in much demand. In fact, I would say at the moment, it's as popular as the paper. And we're delighted by that. Or as popular, even. <laughs> well, you've got plenty of uh, fiber-eating sheep out there in uh, Wales. And they only digest 50% of what they swallow. So coming out, the, coming out of the, the back end of a sheep is 50% cellulose fiber, which has already been pre-chewed, which reduces the amount of processing that we have to do. And, and people love the idea that something that other people would walk past can be turned into something beautiful and, and valuable. So we are, in fact, a zero-waste operation. Everything that comes in the front door goes out as a usable product. So it's the ultimate in recycling, really. Even the, even the washing water is, uh, is sold on as fertilizer. Mr. Toms, how many sheep does it take to make a ream of sheep poo paper? That's an interesting question. If if I wanted to produce one ton of sheep poo, I would need two and a half sheep for one year. Now, obviously, half a sheep wouldn't produce any poo at all. That's just a biological impossibility, but it it gives you a rough idea. It takes about three tons of sheep poo to produce one ton of paper. Mm, That's a lot of poo. That's a lot of paper. (laughs) 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 and a ton of paper is a lot of paper to give to give to give your listeners some idea um three tons of sheep poo making one ton of paper would produce about one hundred and forty thousand greetings cards so that's quite an efficient process we like to think especially when you consider that we don't need to use all of the energy intensive machinery that they use in in traditional paper mills because all of our our fibers have been pre uh, processed by our by our lovely sheep now if i were to write a love letter using sheep poo paper would i be sending the wrong message that is is there any smell to this well there is a smell and funnily enough it's quite pleasant once once, once we've washed it and boiled it what you're essentially left with is basically nothing more than, than macerated hay. And the smell of the paper is a little like a freshly mown hay field. I mean, we think that there's a great romantic value to this. I mean, we, 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 sell, um, we sell all sorts of products that people can use. I mean, of course, you, you have a paper anniversary after one year, and we, sell, we, do, we do sell quite a lot to people, and wedding invitations we've done. Um, but we like to think that roses are red and violets are blue, but our paper's great because it's made of poo. <laughs> <laughs> You can see I spent a lot of time on that one. What about at the uh, at the old factory, and I and I mean the the place you make the paper? Uh, a lot of poop jokes. You'd have thought there might be, but after after a couple of months, I think you run through them all. <laughs> I mean, we we are thinking of running a. a a poetry competition where, where people send in their poems and, and, and we decide which ones are the best and, the, and then we'll publish them on sheet poo paper as, as you know, poetry from Wales. Well, Mr. Toms, thank you very much. No problem at all, Bruce. Nice to speak to you. Lawrence Toms is co-founder of Sheep Poo Paper.
Next week on Living on Earth, on tap, a brewer in Colorado puts a head on it using alternative energy. It may cost more, but that's okay with them. It's a very, very family-oriented place. You can't sling a cat around the brewery without hitting a newborn on any given week. And we want our kids. week south of Wales with a flock of potential papermakers. In County Devon, England, the town of Two Bridges hosts a yearly sheep shearing event during the summer months. John Levick Drever recorded this herd of woolly bleeders being rounded up for a trim. Living on Earth is produced by the World Media Foundation. Our crew includes Ashley Ahern, Eileen Belinsky, Ingrid Lobet, Emily Torgrenson, and Jeff Young, with help from Bobby Bascom and Kelly Cronin. Our interns are Ian Gray, Tobin Hack, and Jennifer Percy. Dennis Foley is our technical director. Our executive producer is Steve Kerwood. Allison Lyrish Dean composed our themes. You can find us at LOE.org. I'm Bruce Gellerman. Thanks for listening. Bye. Funding for Living on Earth comes from the National Science Foundation, supporting coverage of emerging science, and Stonyfield Farm, organic yogurt and smoothies. Stonyfield pays its farmers not to use artificial growth hormones on their cows. Details at stonyfield.com. Support also comes from NPR member stations, the Ford Foundation, the Oak Foundation, and the Saunders Hotel Group of Boston's Lenox and Copley Square Hotels, serving you and the environment while helping preserve the past and protect the future. 800-225-7676. This is NPR, National Public Radio.